<laughs> some moves. Um, Hey everyone, my name is Don, um, Don Nero, and I'm a uh, community software engineer with, the, uh, with Ansible, the Ansible team, and here's my GitHub and Matrix if you want to get in touch, yeah? You have it on screen, you don't need to look there. <laughs> yeah, that's, I deleted my Twitter profile, and I haven't set things up on Mastodon, so, you know, that will have to do. Um, Right, so some acknowledgments before we start. I wanted to give a shout out to Carol. My colleagues, Carol and Greg, who have been like super inspiring and have been, you know, kind of main reason I'm here, really. So it's, it's, it's been great, thanks to them. Thanks to all of you and everyone at Config Management Camp. It's uh, been brilliant being here. Um, everybody's super nice and there's been like so many great ideas going around, so. You know, it's all good stuff. And then my um, old crew in Finispan, I'm new to Ansible. Um, um, does anybody here know in Finispan by any chance? Red Hat? Yeah, it's, I was, yeah. I worked with in Finispan for like four years or so, and I'm scraping a lot of the details from this talk from my involvement with that project, but it's, it's a great project. It's a uh, distributed in-memory data store, and you know, you should check it out if you don't know it. The docs must flow. So um, that's the title of this talk, and what does that mean? For me, this is kind of what it looks like in my head. I know for like other people, it probably like might be different. I don't know what everyone's project's like, but like when you say docs flow, this is um, mm -hmm. how I envision it. Um, you know, you've got community bringing all the, um, the passion and the interest and the willingness to get in and um, like fix stuff and just contribute time and like provide innovation and then um, <clears throat> downstream, um, if you have a downstream, um, you know, bringing in like um, usually like large-scale um, deployments and, you know, expertise and support. Um, and then, you know, test coverage, making sure the documentation is validated and, and um, actually works and it does what it says on, on the tin. And then um, there's content developer. And for me, I think there's a difference between, like, content developer and technical writer. Um, I was a technical writer for years, and I, it's kind of what I was doing before I, like, you know, I'm shifting on to a more technical track with engineering. But I think, you know, tech writing is that discipline of making sure that um, your documentation, you know, it's free from spelling errors, it's grammatically correct, it's well structured, and all that stuff's like super important because like good, mature documentation is an indicator of, well, I guess, maturity in the marketplace. Um, and you know, people take your project seriously. But the content developer, I think, is a superset of the information developer. And I think like within a DevOps team, um, a content developer, it's, you know, it's a vital role. And um, that's what I've kind of always considered myself. I've always just worked directly with engineers and not as like some kind of detached function that just writing stuff over in isolation and don't really know what that's about. <clears throat> so in the abstract for this talk, um, I, I said, you know, there's several mindsets that I think content developers need to have. I was going to touch on those kind of like briefly and, um, you know, kind of go through them. I think that's one of the important things. Um, I think like, you know, I say content developers and technical writers kind of interchangeably here. So if I say those two things, they're kind of synonymous. There are nuances, but you know, whatever, let's not get stuck on that. So yeah, being Switzerland. Um, I think this is kind of the main thing for any content developer, any tech writer that's working with a DevOps engineering team. It's not trying to like impose things. Like if you're an engineering team, you know, they should be the ones that you know, if you want to use like RST and I don't know what it says, use ASCII doc. No, use what the engineering team, you know, use their tools and, you know, meet them where they are. And, yeah, um, you know, I, I'm a firm believer in documentation is an engineering function and all engineers are technical writers. 
Um, does anyone disagree with that? I'm just curious. Usually no one does, but yeah, okay, good. You know. But yeah, so this is kind of the main thing. Without like being Switzerland and like meeting your engineering team, like where they are and how they work and with their tools and with their processes, then you know, everything else I'm gonna talk about just doesn't matter and it's not gonna apply anyway and you're just gonna be in like some silo creating content that is gonna suck. Um, yeah. So a couple other things here, you know, docs as code, I, that's kind of bandied about, but for me that just means like docs live in the same source repository, the same code base as the thing that you're documenting. Um, seems pretty straightforward and simple, but you know, I don't know, not everyone does that. I think it's an important thing, that the thing that you're documenting is, you know, the docs are there and also staying in the same sprint and the release cycle. And for me, that really means like being part of the engineering team, like taking part in like sprint reviews, sprint planning, the whole life cycle. There's room in there for content developers. And that's where you should work. Um, second thing, um, kind of second mindset, which is arguably more important than the first, but doesn't really work if you're not doing the first thing anyway, but community first. Um, you know, publishing docs early and often and making sure that there's that um, soap time for your documentation. And so, you know, if you've got people who are, and within Finispan, we would, you know, get like, you know, people in the community who would just be like individual contributors or comment on the docs. And, you know, that helped us like find silly mistakes and stupid mistakes and big mistakes. and. You know, we'd also get people that were um, working downstream and support that wanted to evaluate like kind of upcoming features and like having the docs out there early meant that like we could make sure that like, you know, procedures weren't missing steps and, um, you know, everything was complete and kind of tied together. And focusing effort on the latest version <laughs> as well um, is, is kind of, a really important one, and that's that's kind of why I have the onion up here as well. You know, like the layers of onions, and you know, eventually, like if you're, if, you know, I believe in like the aggregation of like marginal gains, and if you know you're trying to like stay in the same sprint with like your engineers and your content you're working away, and if you're trying to like if you're working behind and if you're trying to like if if you're you know kind of like your doc cycles are lagging the engineering cycles um, I'm going to joke now it, it, well I'm just going to move on sorry I get, I, I, I get kind of you know stuck in my own head with things. But also like docs when, you know, community first, you're creating opportunities for contributors and like docs are kind of like a natural like, I don't want to say easy, but yeah, it is kind of an easy way for people to jump in and like start making contributions and like even non-technical people can, yeah, that word spelled wrong and let me, you know, add it on GitHub or whatever. Um, and, you know, I firmly believe, and I've seen this, I, I've seen this in action, I've seen this at Red Hat, um, that, you know, upstream, it's, it, it is a more difficult path, but when your docs are, like, in that silo and they're not upstream and it's, like, kind of in this disconnected way, over time, quality degrades, whereas if it's upstream, like, you get more, like, you know, maintenance and quality actually improves over time. So that's the second mindset. The third thing, which is maybe a little bit counterintuitive, but I think it's important for content developers, especially in like DevOps to kind of work and becoming an early adopter and breaking stuff. It's a fun way to learn. It's also a good way to um, work with engineers and, you know, if, you know, you're kind of like working on like writing something up and you know, you break things and you can go back and figure out if you're, you know, am I doing something stupid or is this like broken? And um, it leads to, it leads to um, just, you know, better code actually. 
Um, and you know, getting obstacles out of the user's way and like removing that like barrier to entry and that increases adoption um, and you know makes it easier for people to use your project. I love this XKCD um, cartoon. It's my it's my favorite one. It's it's the best. Um, so with those three things um, kind of in mind, um, the final thing is just like embracing your mistakes, I think, and you know, keeping going. And one of the best pieces of advice that was given to me is just, you know, like, you know, have a vision and you'll get to it like bit by bit and just keep going. I'm showing this because this was actually like this part of the project that I was working on with InfiniSpan. We were like starting um, like, Refactoring all the code base to get off like EAP and all this like really heavy like um, really cycle or like all of these like dependencies that would like you know spend your time like patching like CVEs for like libraries that you didn't even use and it slowed down the release cadence and as part of that like I went in and was starting to like break up all these like monolithic books that were just like these kind of like dumping grounds for you know like engineers which is saying hey, we're going to put this in you know the server guide and even though it's like related to clients and we kind of like started with like I think like three or four guides and we like went out and expand and we had like all these other guys and kind of like brought it back down and this was kind of like the like the weird teenage years when we like redesigned the website it was like jackal and all that but it, um I don't know it was kind of looking back on it, it was kind of cringe but if we hadn't gone there then you know we wouldn't actually get the result that we got in the end which is much better and you know check out infinispan.org docs sometime, give it a look. Um, so those are, those are kind of mindsets. So I think once you have those kind of mindsets in place, like how do you, like how do you go about like executing, you know? And we are gonna talk about like CICD stuff in here a little bit more. Like I know I'm kind of like maybe talking more for like content developers here. Um, but it's important to, I think, like talk about these things as like making the, how you make the docs flow, you know? And like part of the documentation, it's, well, I mean, documentation is there for the user, right? Like it's there to um, help the user, like support them along their journey. And so if that's what it's there for, you have to be able to like identify your user and understand their journey. And um, to do that, like defining personas is one of the first steps. I know like the personas are often like this UX, like, like really like define like this is, I don't know, like Antonio and like he's a Scorpio and his favorite color is brown and there's all this detail that like you do not need, you know? And like maybe for some UX thing, if you're doing like a website, then yeah, maybe, but for, you know, for docs, you just need to understand like who are the main people that are using the content? Um, you know, where the, what level of knowledge do they have? Um, what kind of needs do they have? Um, how much content do they need? You know, a developer who encounters an error is probably going to be more curious and want more information and find out, oh, you know, what's going on? How did I, you know, break that? But if it's maybe like an SRE and there's a, you know, red light flashing on a dashboard somewhere, it's just, you know, how do I remediate that quickly? I want, you know, less detail, just show me. Um, and it also helps you figure out where, you know, where's the location where the users can access the content. And that helps you with that flow to connect users with the content. Um, so then once you get your personas, um, you know, they're the journey milestones. And this is actually the Kubernetes journey. Has anybody seen this before? I'm familiar with this. We've got the kind of main milestones along the user's journey. There's, you know, aware. It's like, what is this thing? And then you evaluate it. Then you adopt, and then you scale out. And at each of those milestones, you know, there are different activities and different um, tasks and things that users are trying to achieve. And you can start mapping those things out. And this is a really, this is actually something uh, Sveas and I have kind of brainstormed about and it's, don't pay any attention to it right now because it's kind of, you know, just to illustrate the point. 
but um, you know, you're starting having out the user journeys and you can see like the full content set there and you can see where the gaps are um, and you get, you, know, you, you get the full scope once you can start mapping, mapping those things out and describing the user journeys and what the steps are. So those are, those are kind of the, you know, the, once you have those, um, then kind of getting into, you know, your structure and like how do you, you know, how do you work with um, <coughs> engineering teams and like developing your, developing your actual content. And there's this, um, does anybody know diataxis? Anyone? Anybody using it? Like, are you? Trying to. <laughs> um, it's great. It's this. Um, so, you know, there are three, I guess, like kind of like base information types for um, technical content. You know, there's concepts where you're kind of explaining a concept, and um, tasks where you're performing an action doing a procedure, and then there's reference. And I think most content developers, you, you know, you can start like mapping that those things make sense. But I think like when you start getting into like trying to like get too low level and like start doing topic-based writing, and then you like wind up with this like, you know, has anybody done data XML? Yeah, you know, it's just like all these like topics, and it's really like scary from a file system perspective because you like go into the docs directory and like boom, you know, you got like hundreds of files, and you know you got to like grab through to find where you are, and like actually making a contribution then turns into like a real pain, and it might be great for like some kind of like big you know system, but not for not for a DevOps team, you know. Um, Diataxis is a really great framework for you know where you can where you can where those things kind of converge in a way that um, you know supports user journey based documentation. I think like engineers would naturally write more reference content where you have like you know these are the programmatic options and their expected behavior, where content developers would focus more on. I think would focus more naturally on writing um, procedures and you know concepts and you know the user story and understanding that. Um, so diataxis is a great framework for kind of bringing those things together, but also trying to, I guess, I don't want to say like areas of responsibility, but I think like it helps, you know, and I'll show some examples later where you, you know, where if you've got engineers that are like writing all this reference content, and you know, that's great, encourage that. That's a good way of, you know, working. And like content developers can, you know, focus on the tutorials and the how-tos and the explanation. So once you've kind of got those things, I think you're, you know, you're ready to rock. Um, some of the things that I found um, in working with like DevOps and like doing CI/CD and like moving contents and you know it's just it's not that complex really. I mean it's like file you get know, like a bunch of text files that you're moving around, but you know it's good to like keep things simple and like keeping the source simple. Um, and some of the things that, that that I found work is like if you know if you're including files. You know, like an includes directive, an ASCII doc, or like the literal includes and RST. Um, you know, keep those files kind of under the path of the files that they're referencing, not in like you know another folder like two levels up where you have to like kind of where you, where you can't really find them. Um, also, like things like you know deeply nested headings where you're just like drilling down, and you know it can make stuff awkward. Like if you're like actually if you transform like um, RST into ASCII doc and you know the way in RST you can have like th there's all that like different markup for like different levels of heading like you can use the carrot symbol or the squiggly line and you know that makes sense but for trying to convert those it gets really nasty kind of quickly and so it's better to you know keep the 
keep the headings not too deep, and don't use things like ASCII.callouts. I really hate that. Do you guys know what ASCII.callouts are? At least, yeah, it's, you know, it, those are fine if you've got like a canonical example of something that you want to show, and an ASCII.callout, it's just like a one thing that you put between brackets and, you know, it, then underneath the, ex, un, underneath the code block, you can add like a description. Um, but usually what happens is like you're basically putting ASCII doc in something like, you know, I don't know, like YAML or, you know, like, you know, a piece of Java code or, you know, whatever it is. So you're kind of mixing those things. And it's better to just use like, you know, the native comments for something, and, you know. That kind of actually ties into um, my next point, which is not embedding um, in code blocks. It's much better to, um, if, if you're using like ASCII doc or RST, you can do it with Markdown, but it's a little bit trickier. Um, but say you've got like a bunch of ASCII doc files and you embed YAML in them, that's you know, then you can't, you know, you're mixing markup then, and you can't, like, lint your um, YAML that, like, you know, as part of your CI, like, on a, in a PR, and, you know, you can, like, hook in YAML lint, and you can um, test and validate. Actually, one of the things within Finispan, because it's a Java project, um, we, took, we had all these Java classes and like this, you know, Java folder that we were using examples, and I broke them all out of the ASCII doc, and then we used this utility called JBang, which is just, you know, Java, but like scripting, to go through and like kind of like iterate through them and like try and validate all the, all the classes, and it worked really well. So, you know, I don't think you would want to put, like, have you ever seen XML in Java? No, it's, it's horrible. You can imagine, right? It's kind of the same principle, you know, just don't mix your formats too much. And, you know, this, it, it also helps during review because, you know, engineers will look at a docs PR and they'll say, oh, they ask you, doc, yeah, grant, yeah. But then when you kind of look at, a, you know, YAML or like some other piece of code, you know, it kind of makes more sense. And you can also then use them during testing. Um, that's something that we were doing. The QE team would start looking at like, oh, we've got this, you know, in, in our docs repo, there are all these examples and all these like snippets of, you know, Java code and like we had, I don't know, like, I don't think there's any Python, but I was thinking about Ansible. But you know what I mean, like the QE team could then take those and like integrate them into their test suite and you know, it was a good thing. And it kind of brought them in and they actually started doing like a lot more doc reviews after that, which was pretty sweet. Next slide, semantic line breaks. There we go, yeah. I mean, once you start using, like, um, and this is a shout out to Dan Allen, who's one of the lead developers for ASCII Doc. Once you start using um, semantic line breaks, and I'm gonna get this to happen in the Ansible Docs repo, because you can do it with RST, but you know, like it'll form, if, if, if you go with one sentence per line, RST and ASCII Doc and Markdown, and, you know, Markdown's a little tricky because I guess they're different flavors, but you know, it will naturally form paragraphs. So there's no need to like string your sentences together and like form a paragraph manually when you know the markup will do that for you. And again, like when you're converting as part of like CI or whatever, um, it prevents reflows where a change at the front of the at the top of the line will make things shift position. So then you, you know, if, you, if you're trying to use sad for like a replace or something, you don't, you know, it, it makes that like really unpredictable. Um, also, it's really easy to like swap and, you know, like comment out like a sentence. Like if something applies to community only, you can comment it when you, you know, 
um, as part of your CI pipeline, or you know, you can remove things, and you know, it's easier to you know. Then there's the good stuff, like you see sentences that are like way too long, which is you know usually not a great thing if like a one sentence goes on forever. So um, and those are some some things that you know once. You know, you have the mindsets in place and, you know, using diataxis and writing user journeys. Those are just some recommendations that I would make. Um, now, I'm going to talk to you about, like, using some CICD techniques and trying to actually solve some problems. And one of the things um, that, um, you know, I said before, don't, like, impo try and impose, like, implementation on, you know, a docs implementation on an engineering team. Um, you know, use the tools that the engineering team are using, you know, they, it's, it's, they own it, they own the project, you know, and a content developer should be part of the engineering team. Um, and you shouldn't have to accommodate like other people, like putting these restrictions on you um, and your, you know, a, a, and your work. But so, just before we go into, um, we'll, so what we're looking at here is this ASCII doc publishing cycle. Um, and it starts like, it, ha you know, it has to be in GitLab because there's like this Jenkins instance that pulls the repos and like will like periodically, you know, like look for changes and put them on like, you know, the stage where you can like verify them. Um, but it goes from like ASCII doc because it's structured into docbook XML. And then it goes from there into like XHTML, and then from there, you know, it's 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 out on the you know um, the the front end kind of portal place. So there was this um, to deal with, and um, so there was you know like going community first. Um, how did we go, which usually means like being in GitLab, so how do you go from, um, or sorry, GitHub, how do you get into like GitLab? So um, my solution for this was just like, you know, I'm not gonna like, I, I was helping, um, well, a couple of times. I, you, so there are different ways to do it. I've seen teams that have like used like this script that like just basically has this like, you know, it's like, this kind of get workflow in it, that, you know, checking out like head and like pushing and like you know all that kind of stuff, but it's it can lead to just things blowing up. Um, this you know I was just going for like what's the simplest thing that we can do, or like you know if if somebody wants to like synchronize their changes from like basically so like writing teams don't have to touch it and just automatically goes in and I don't have to think about GitLab and I don't want to think about GitLab and it's fine if you're using GitLab and it's, you know it's no problem it's not that's you know that's not what I'm saying but what I'm saying is you know keep the workflow simple and just synchronize automatically and that's where that's where Jenkins comes in and you know there, there, there are different ways to do it. Like you could put it in a GitHub action. You could you know you could use Ansible. Um, lots of ways. But um, Jenkins is what I came with at the time. And you know just it's basically a Bash script that runs on a cron. You know like Jenkins is it's kind of just like a cron, right? You know it's, I don't want to reduce it down to that, but you know. Um, so that's what we're doing. And so if we look here, um, like on the, um, this is kind of the repo layout. And this is actually like the Ansible um, Automation Platform Clouds. Do, do you guys know that? There's like AAP on clouds. Oh, they're docs. Like I set up a branch for them in this repo that's in the Ansible organization. And a lot of their engineers that they work with Sorry, I had time. Yeah, I got to hustle. Um, a lot of the engineers, like you know, we want them contributing. So like everything's like kind of, um, I guess, like a little bit more expanded. And like you know, user stories. You've got this directory structure. Like we synchronize it into um, GitLab, and things go into like the, 
basically are just like copied into these folders. And then there are just the um, artifacts that are downstream only. There's like one main kind of like assembly file that's the title for it. And then there's like some metadata. So basically, just copy everything, copy everything over from the upstream. And like publishing is as simple as like I'm going to hook this like main ASCII doc file in, and boom, walk away, you know. But all the content is in upstream, and it just gets it gets synced over. Um, as probably more to say, but I'm going to just move on. This is what the job looks like. Um, it's like really super simple. It's intentionally simple. Um, you know, and the idea that, so there are a couple of things, you know, if you're, if you're, if you're taking like stuff that's community and you're like taking it downstream, if you're touching it, if you're modifying it, like any kind of manipulation, that needs to be done in the open. So it's the community can see what you're doing. It's like, you know, you want to take somebody else's contribution and then change it where they can't see it. That's not cool. Um, so, you know, that script goes upstream, but it's also like, you know, just like really straightforward copy of text files. And like, it's just the, the script uses just like super simple, like copy and like, you know, make directory and that's it. And you can make it fancy, but the reason why it's like that is so just like any, anybody can go in and look at it, see what's going on. You know, there's no, there's no magic. If somebody else wants to copy a file somewhere, like some other writer needs to do it, then it's really simple for them to, for them to, for them to do that. Um, and it lives in the source repo. And then and Jenkins, it's you know freestyle job, and it's basically just run the script and then commit it to GitLab. One of the fun things um, that I. I um, an, an, another thing with Ansible, with um, Ansible Lint, it's it's all in Markdown, um, and I wanted to I, I, I helped that team like with some of their documentation, like writing rules and stuff like that. It's like yeah, it's all in Markdown. That's cool. You're good to go. Like I'm not going to make you like do ASCII doc. Um, so what we're going to do is just convert it, and then we're going to like sync it into like you know this other repo and then, you know, do the Jenkins thing, get in the GitLab, and, you know, we're good to go. We've got Lint docs. Um, this is a look at the um, playbook that I wrote. This is kind of how I started learning and using Ansible, and it might be like a completely, like, you know, it might be abuse of Ansible. I don't know. Nobody's yelled at me for doing it yet, and it works. It's not, you know, it's not configuring infrastructure. It's just, you know, again, um, but you know, you just find the markdown files, and then there's the you know the shell script that you know uses cramdoc. Just a point on that: um, if you're converting from cram, if you're converting markdown, I'd recommend cramdoc because it's part of the ASCII doc tool chain. But for like RST, we use pandoc, which is a really cool way. It's like a Swiss knife utility for going between different formats. Um, so it's that, and this is the, um, the action that that runs in. Um, did you guys know that like um, Ansible is on GitHub, GitHub runners by just out of the box? I found that out, it was great. Because I was writing everything in Bash, and I was like, yeah, I could put everything in Ansible and be like much nicer. And I did, and I found that runs just boom, Ansible playbook, there you go. Um, so it's, you know, there's probably better ways to do that. People are a lot smarter than I could probably look at that and like optimize it, but you know, it works. Um, another thing I talked about like, um, you know, engineers write more reference. So like here's this example of like reference content, like putting that in source. I feel like, you know, reference content should go into the source and I mean like into the code base as much as possible and you extract it from there, right? And then that means like what's in your documentation directory, it's mostly, you know, procedures and like the concepts and you don't have a lot of, you, I kind of feel like that's one of the measures of like a pretty healthy content set for me. It's like when you look in the docs and you see in the docs, you know, path or whatever, and you see mostly like, 
procedures and, and concepts and not a lot of reference. And in, in this example, um, we put all the man pages in um, ASCII doc because you know, we were rewriting everything, refactoring the code base, and came time to do the CLI. And I took a look at like an old, old version of the CLI docs, and it was ridiculous. I don't know if that's like really, but like the first one, and I didn't write this, um, but yeah, the first one's like the bin command, the begin command starts a transaction. And then there's like some example, but you know, it doesn't explain any of the options. It's, you know, if you're trying to learn it, it's like, you know, it's terrible. It's just like the most superficial. Um, so anyway, like knocking that old documentation. But we decided like, yeah, we're not gonna do that. You know, we've got the man pages, we'll put them in ASCII doc, and then we're just gonna like copy them over and like put them in the documentation directory and move them from like the CLI, you know, in the source and like just copy them into the docs and that way we can hook them in to our, um, into the in, into the new um, into the new um, CLI title that we had, and like all the all, all, all the content, like you know, it could be more like, you know, here's how you use these commands, and if you you want the reference stuff, then we're just reusing those man pages because we've copied them across. It's part of CI. Um, another one kind of like this is there's there, there's an enum that was in some of the some of the Java doc, and you know. Don't do things like have a procedure and it's like, you know, you, you know, you're like copying this reference content. And, you know, if it's, you know, you can see in step four, you can put in the database dialect and, yeah, you know, which dialect's going to use? Look at the enum. Don't put it in the, you know, don't put it all in the, you know, like a table that like pretty much duplicates that. Because, you know, if you do that, that means that, like, you know, the developer, the engineer is probably going to be, you know, maintaining the um, the Java docs, and you're going to have that you're going to have that disconnect. You know what I mean? Like, if they add like a new database dialect, that's going to show up in the Java docs, but it might not show up in the documentation source. So then you're going to be, you know, out of sync, and it's going to be inaccurate. Um, Another example were the log messages. Um, this one just, I had a bit more to say about this, but I'll just kind of like go quickly. We added a um, description annotation where, you know, if you wanted to look through all your log messages and then you would get like the, um, an extended example or extended description and a user action. And this was one that we intended for like more SRE teams because we're moving to a managed service and, you know, those people usually need logs, so, um, and then it was easy just to like have all that stuff generated as like an HTML page, so we didn't have to write um, anything about like error messages actually in the docs because that's just more reference content. Um, another good one: don't document your UI. Never. That's like an admission of failure. If, you're, if your UI needs like separate documentation, your UI has failed. You know what I mean? It's like putting lights on a roundabout. So, you know, but this one was um, as a, you know, React console um, that we were working on and like just added like this localization library and we could put all the, all the text strings and all the tooltips and everything, and like a JSON file that was kind of externalized from the code, so you didn't have, you know, if you wanted to change like a string or something, you didn't have to like go digging into like TypeScript and find out like, you know, where is this? But that allowed us then to like get some pattern fly people who were like really good at microcopy, much better than I am, but I could, I, I could go out and like, hey, like you pattern fly people that know microcopy, come check out this console we've been working on. And here are all the strings. They're all in like this handy JSON file that you can like make sense of and all your work's in one place. And do you want to contribute to this? And do you want to you know, make this better? Because you know, right now I've been writing and it might well suck. I don't know. But um, that was another example of like kind of breaking up, you know, the, you know extracting docs from the code. Um, UI. Okay, so I had some 
I wanted to do more about CICD. Um, I don't know how great this is going to be, but I took some screenshots of GitHub Actions. I thought, yeah, you know, it'd be kind of fun. What I really wanted to do was have a T-shirt going out here. <laughs> <laughs> but we'll do this instead, okay? So um, one of the things that like, you know, like synchronizing files across repos, so like, you know, back to like if you've got all like your, you know, bits of YAML and your examples or, and you know, like, you might want to reuse those in like a different place. So, you know, rsync is your friend um, and that's what this, um, that's what this is doing. It just you know runs on a cron and you know um, checks out the you know the free parts of the path and whatever. Um, and it's just like you know our syncs over files from one repo to another, so you could then include them in the in, in the docs in both both places and kind of single source them in that way. Um, also updating. Um, updating the published docs on commits. Um, the InfiniSpan docs are in GitHub pages, so it's really easy to, you know, um, check out and um, actually wrote a, um, a, if you use an ASCII doc, and you could check out that action I wrote that um, just goes through, you point it to your documentation path and it'll go through and they'll generate HTML from your ASCII doc and then you can just, um, copy it across, real simple, and then your docs, every time, you know, there's a commit, your docs on your website are up to date with the latest. Um, another one, there's a build preview docs on commit that um, I did for the AAP, um, the AAP on clouds and some other AAP docs. Um, it's just this one again, it's just you know using that same action, but then you can use the HTML preview um, thingy on GitHub to actually like render the HTML, and you can you know you can kind of preview your work then, um, and that's it. Thanks.